Hello everybody, I'm Peter Hudson. I'm the Director of the Centre for Palliative Care and welcome to our first Hot Topic Seminar for 2021. I'm really pleased to be able to advise you that we've had almost 700 people register for this particular seminar, which is absolutely fantastic. So thanks very much for being part of it. Uh, Dr. Julie McDonald is our guest presenter today and after Julie's uh, presentation, there's going to be plenty of time for questions and comments. So I would encourage you to think about questions as Julie is presenting and you're very welcome to log those via the system as she's actually talking because then we'll actually establish a pool of questions that we can uh, draw upon at the end of Julie's presentation. So please don't hold back, a great opportunity to talk to Julie as an expert in this area. So uh, that was, would be fantastic if you could do that. Just before I introduce Julie, um, just wanted to acknowledge that in the spirit of reconciliation, the Centre for Palliative Care acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land and sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. So Dr Julie uh, MacDonald is dual trained in respiratory medicine and palliative care. Her specialty focus includes lung oncology patients and those with advanced non-malignant disease. Her active areas of clinical and research interest are symptom control of breathlessness and cough and integration of early palliative care and advanced care planning in the advanced lung disease patient group. Julie is widely published internationally in the areas of breathlessness and palliative care and she was recently awarded some research funding to extend her program of work and delighted to advise that she also recently received a Young Investigator of the Year Award, which is absolutely fantastic. So congratulations, Julie, on behalf of all of us. So very warm welcome to you, Julie, on behalf of all of us. And um, I'll hand over to you now and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you for the introduction, Peter, and Tina Koto Katoa. Greetings to you all. I'd like to talk to you today about the Respiratory Supportive Care Service that I've been lucky enough to pilot and establish at St Vincent's over the last three years. In this talk, I'd like to introduce the need for an integrated respiratory palliative care approach for patients with advanced lung disease and run you through the preliminary results of our pilot program in the usual aims, method and results format. And then I'll end briefly with an overview of the service and research developments that have occurred since the pilot was completed. Patients with advanced chronic obstructive pulmonary disease have a higher symptom burden and psychological burden and a lower quality of life than that of the advanced lung cancer patient. They have high healthcare costs as a 2016-17 financial year audit at St Vincent's revealed, COPD patients have a prolonged average length of stay and recurrent hospital admissions. 23% require two or more admissions within 12 months. Whilst approximately half these admissions are considered potentially avoidable with timely respiratory outpatient management, only 15% of that cohort were seen by specialist respiratory and outpatients and palliative care only connected with 3%. This unfortunately low level of specialist input is in line with national statistics. Barriers to attending specialist clinic in a timely fashion can include difficulty attending clinic due to breathlessness, low function, social isolation and transport issues, while wait lists at outpatient respiratory at St Vincent extend beyond six months. Low referral rates to palliative care may again reflect the, the fact that the patients um, oops, I'm having trouble with my slides there, sorry already. The, po the patients may see the patients' clinicians may see that it, uh, palliative care is only for those with advanced malignancy or terminal care, or that um, patients may feel abandoned by their regular physician or indeed it could be that clinicians struggle with the timing of palliative care referral due to the uncertainty in prognosticating in this area. The St Vincent Strategic Service Plan for 2025 committed to creating new models of palliative care through the early introduction of palliative care 
and to integrate palliative care within hospital specialties and community care. This vision paved the way for our pilot program. We proposed a flexible, integrated ambulatory model of respiratory and palliative care that would address the gaps in patients with advanced lung disease and align with St. Vincent's strategic service plan. The respiratory supportive care service uh, pilot consisted of two intertwining components. The respiratory supportive care outpatient service, which is nestled within the weekly respiratory clinic at St. Vincent's, and a physician home visit, which is conducted weekly to patients who are having difficulty attending the outpatient clinic. We successfully secured a St. Vincent's Hospital Australia Research Endowment Fund grant to help design and assess the outcomes of the pilot study. This prospective dual cohort pilot study of the respiratory and supportive care service aimed to help explain the differences between the patients seen at home visit and and outpatient clinics, describe the model of care provided at both home visits and outpatients, and me measure the potential impact on healthcare utilisation before and after the first physician review. And now to the study methods. The pilot was a collaborative project between respiratory and palliative medicine departments, St Vincent's Health Independence Program called Complex Care Service, and the, and the Centre for Palliative Care, with all teams contributing to methodology and research provision. The two components of the Respiratory Supportive Care Service had two timelines, and due to, due to independent funding streams and access to leave cover, I'll explain at the end how the service has expanded and changed since this pilot completion. But for now, I'll explain the pilot model that we studied. The outpatient group was recruited between April 2018 and April 2020. The initial outpatient reviews by were, were by a respiratory or respiratory and palliative care physician, and then subsequently were introduced to the palliative care physician. The plan was for regular and ongoing care with non-abandonment, rather than many of the short-term education-based breathlessness services published to date. The home visit group recruited between July 2018 and July 2019. Um, apologies for the mistake on the screen. The physician home visits were limited to those recruited to the St Vincent's Hospital Melbourne Health Independence Program Complex Care Service. And reviews were conducted by myself along with the complex care um, clinician. To explain that briefly, complex care at St. Vincent's is a home-based multidisciplinary care model for patients with chronic disease who are at risk of hospital admissions. Multidisciplinary care is directed by the patient goals and the clinical care needs and could include physio, occupational therapy, social work, psychology, dietitian, speech language and social work input. Physician home visits were usually one-off visits reserved for complex care patients who were having trouble attending um, outpatient clinics due to their symptoms, their function, or their social supports. Home visits were also limited to that um, St. Vincent's catchment zone, which included Mel Melbourne, Bondora, Yarra, and Darabin areas. The home visit patients, um, again, I'm just sorry, losing my slides here. What slide are you hoping to be on, Julie? I might be able to move it oh, forward. Oh, sorry, no, it's all right. It. It's, just, it's just the notes page. I'm not sure why it's um, having a buggy time. Uh, okay, so you're on... Uh, the two components, you the, thank you. Yeah, you're happy yes. with that. If you need me to move yeah. any forward, just let me know. Yeah. Thank you. No dramas, no worries. Although some patients move between the home visit and the outpatient cohort, um, the different timelines meet the two services didn't always overlap during the, the, the pilot. There were no definite inclusion or exclusion criteria referral, although common lung diseases could include COPD, bronchiectasis, asthma, interstitial lung disease, and pulmonary hypertension. Suggested triggers for referral to the service included a high symptom burden, such as breathlessness, cough, anxiety, or depression, recurrent emergency presentations or hospital admissions, or frequent exacerbations of the lung disease. 
decreased social function or social circumstances that limited health engagement or attendance at the outpatient service, a development of type 1 or type 2 respiratory failure or extended review to address prognosis or future care plans. The triggers for referral were based on both a mixture of established evidence for specialty care and respiratory and on emerging evidence on who might potentially benefit from a holistic care, palliative care approach. The suggestion is that research to date is that palliative care referral should be triggered more from a high symptom burden rather than that of a poor prognostic assessment. The model of care provided at each review was guided again by established evidence base of the Australasian COPDX guidelines, and, and this recognises and this also recognises the emerging role of palliative care in the management of advanced lung disease. Key tasks during the review included to establish the diagnosis and severity of the lung disease and optimise comorbid conditions and control of the lung disease, such as review of inhalers, oxygen prescription, vaccination status, and rehabilitation referral. We also assessed the physical and psychological symptoms and implemented a personalized breathlessness action plan. We then developed future care plans to manage uh, care, including a disease-specific action plan, such as for COPD, asthma, or heart failure and then spent time educating and communicating with the patient and the carer and healthcare team about illness, management, prognosis, and discussion of advanced care plans. We rationalized medications and appointments and arranged referral to services including community palliative care. So I'll move on to the design of the study pilot. The pilot had two groups the home visit and the outpatient clinic group. The demographic and clinical data explored the differences between those patients first seen at home visit compared to those first seen in the outpatient clinic. Descriptive data defined the key tasks completed in the home visit and outpatient reviews, which helped to outline the model of care we actually provided. A retrospective analysis explored hospital utilization in the 90 days before and after the first physician review. This included the, a number of acute hospital admissions, the cumulative total bed days of acute hospital admissions, and the number of outpatient attendances before and after the first review. The results remain preliminary, with focus at, at present on the raw data analysis. And now I'll move on to results, starting with demographic and clinical characteristics. 51 patients were initially reviewed in the physician home visiting cohort across the two-year period, while 58 were first seen in outpatient clinic. This table describes the demographic data and health status of the initial review. The two groups were very similar in their mean age of 75 years, the proportion of male sex, and that they both commonly reported they lived alone with no carer. COPD was the common diagnosis in both groups, followed by interstitial lung disease and asthma. Both groups were equally very breathless, with 43% of each group describing a modified medical research council dyspnea scale of four, which is defined as breathless while dressing or too breathless to leave the house. The groups were different in that the home visit group was more likely not to speak English as a first language, was more likely to be a current smoker, and was less likely to have an oxygen prescription. The home visiting group also had a much lower functional score with 47% describing an Aus Australian modified Karnowski performance scale of 50 or less, which is defined as requiring considerable assistance with frequent medical care. You can see already that the groups are quite different and there's many possible reasons for this. And the first is mainly that we chose the group the home visiting group patients based on the fact that they had low function and difficulties attending outpatients. And you can see from these group, the group demographics, why this group could struggle. They've got a much lower function, not as often speaking English, and they're already very breathless with less oxygen prescription. And you can see already that perhaps without that home visiting outreach part, 
um, these patients in particular may have really struggled to access specialist care. So now I'll move on to the key tasks that defined the model of care provided in those reviews. Sixty-four home visits and 245 outpatient reviews were completed across the two two-year timelines. The home visits typically lasted between 60 and 90 minutes, with travel time and care coordination outside that. Only one visit per week was available with myself as a dual trained respiratory palliative care physician along with the complex care team. Outpatient reviews were typically shorter, between 30 to 45 minutes for the respiratory reviews and um, 45 to 60 for the palliative care reviews. With the higher number of reviews reflecting the fact that there were two physicians and we had a total of six appointments per week. Across um, all outpatient reviews, 100% of the outpatient cohort were seen by respiratory, while 83% met palliative care at some time. The median number of home visits reviews per patient was one, while the median outpatient visits was two, though this ranged more dramatically between one and 10. Initial reviews at both sites focused on clarifying the diagnosis, defining the disease severity and optimising disease control. Similarly, key tasks completed about both home visit and outpatient reviews included patient and carer education about the disease, the management and the prognosis. About two thirds of the both groups spent time implementing or reviewing um, breathlessness action plans such as that for anxiety and panic. Breathlessness action plans could include a plan with instructions like stop where you are when you're breathless, get into a position that helps your breathing, such as those up on the screen, slow your breathing to exhale like blowing a candle, relax your shoulders down, repeat a mantra like breathe, use a handheld fan, and two puffs of Ventolin. And then advice could be tailored like apply your oxygen, have a dose of your opioids and when to call an ambulance or the community palliative care team. The home visits were able to be more personalised. So if breathlessness was common in the shower, we could direct the patient, we, we could review the patient um, at, the, at the bathroom area and suggest rest at this bench, open this window and put your handheld fan here. The home visit reviews were able to be, uh, were able to also complete a higher review of medications and appointment rationalisation and were more likely to also complete disease specific action plans like what to do if cough or shortness of breath occurred in COPD. Difference for these reasons of task completion between the two groups could include the fact that the home reviews were longer and more tasks could obviously therefore be completed. Also we were able to easily review the medications when we're in the patient's home. And also the home visiting group were a lower function and also it so often were more um, open to rationalisation of hospital appointments. Remember this home visiting group also had that wraparound care of the complex care service, meaning that the allied health team could both prepare the patient um, for the physician home visit and then also help enact the plans that we commenced during that visit. I think it's important to note here that I don't necessarily think that more tasks completed per review would con be considered better quality of care, um, as task completion was really personalised to the need of the patient and um, governed by how much time we had. Regarding the final destination of the patients, 62% of that outpatient cohort remained under outpatient review, while only 22% of the home visiting cohort was referred into respiratory supportive care outpatient clinic. 20% of the home visiting patients were referred on to community palliative care, compared to only 9% in the outpatient group. Advanced care planning discussion was noted at each review and documented it in, in its own section of the electronic medical patient record for easy future reference. Home visits more commonly discussed at advanced care planning than the outpatient reviews. Again, this may be due to the lower function of this patient or the lower perceived prognosis, or because there was more time, or because of the complex care team again helped prepare the patient for the advanced care planning discussion in advance. Or perhaps we feel it was because the advanced care planning discussions flowed much more naturally when you're in the patient's home, 
when it was easy to discuss what was important, important with the patient when you could see them in their garden, surrounded by family photos or their pets or belongings. You'll note that when advanced care planning discussions were considered per patient at some time across all of their reviews, there was a similar high level of planning discussion at around the 80% mark, showing we did get there at some stage for most patients. When it came to completion of the formal advanced care planning paperwork, like advanced care directives and medical power of attorney, the outpatient group was more likely to complete this paperwork compared to the home visiting group at some stage across all their reviews, which again may reflect that most of the home visiting patients only had one review and the paperwork's pretty time consuming and not necessarily a great idea to complete when you first meet them. The overall completion rate of either an advanced care directive or a medical power of attorney was around 40% for the home visiting group and 50% for the outpatient group. And that may sound surprisingly low, but it's actually slightly above the international data stating that even with palliative care support and discussion, only around 30 to 40% of advanced COPD and advanced cancer patients complete this paperwork. And there's a lot of evidence out there on why, including why the rates are so low, including the fact that they have to be completed in English in Australia, the fear of the binding nature of the document, the fear that a medical power of attorney may override their own wishes, a general dislike to discuss wishes in such depth, or a fear that discussion or documentation of the end of life care wishes could somehow bring death on. The last component of the model of care I'd like to discuss is the use of opioids for breathlessness. And for simplification here, I've just got one graph with all 109 of the patients. The data was similar across both home visiting and outpatient groups. This graph captures that 24% of our patients were on opioids at the initial review, though that was not necessarily for breathlessness. 18% were com commenced on opioids during one of our reviews and 5% were started by another team. 53% were never trialled on opioids and 6% had their opioids ceased during a review. The differing reasons for not trialling opioids in this cohort was not captured in the study, but I think the prevalence does support our continued limited understanding of the role of opioids in chronic breathlessness, including who may benefit, who would even agree to pre prescription, and who can be safely prescribed opioids. Now I'll move on to the potential impact on healthcare utilisation. Acute hospital admissions trended down in both the home visiting cohort and the outpatient cohort over the 90 days before and after first physician review. The home visit cohort decreased by 30% from 106 total admissions for 51 patients in 90 days to 74 admissions, which is an average of 2.07 per patient in 90 days down to 1.5 per patient. The outpatient group similarly decreased by 39%, but from only 49 admissions to 30 admissions in 90 days, which is an average of 0.84 per patient to 0.51. I think even seeing a trend to stabilise over time is important here, as acute admissions usually increase in the last six months of life in patients with a severe lung disease. And these results with a, tend to, a, a tendency to decrease are in line with two similarly published studies of integrated respiratory and palliative care, although neither of those trials specifically had that home visit physician outreach component to their service. You can also see here that the home visiting group had a much higher number of admissions, and there are many possible reasons that for this compared to the outpatient group. Firstly, the demographic and healthcare data that I've shown you showed that this group had a much poorer baseline prop, uh, baseline function, and as I'll show you soon, I think they also had a poorer prognosis. Secondly, the home visit group were already under complex care service, so by definition of a re referral to that service, they'd been identified at high risk of recurrent admissions. The other confounder to consider is that the complex care team intervention in itself had been studied, has been studied already and showed that it decreases acute hospital presentations. So potentially this home visiting group had already had an impact to decrease the potentially preventable admissions. 
substitute bed card admissions such as palliative care unit admissions are not shown here, but they did increase slightly before compared to after in both groups. And more data is pending on this, and we will consider it in the cost analysis. The cumulative total bed days of all hospital admissions also decreased in the home visiting cohort by 25% from 290 total days for 51 patients to 200 days, or an average of 5.7 days per patient over that 90 day period, down to 4.3 per patient. The outpatient cohort also decreased, but more greatly from 58% by 58% from 200 days to 85, or an average of 2.9 days per person for 90 days, down to 1.5. The reason for this potential impact on bed days are hypothetical, and it could include that, that there was already clarity around um, from the reviews around action plans and advanced care plans. And this impact is again in line with one of the two internationally published studies of integrated respiratory and palliative care. This slide assesses the specialist outpatient attendances at the hospital in the 90 days pre and post that first physician review. Despite the home visiting group have a really high number of rationalisation of appointments completed as a key task during their home visit reviews, there appeared to be no impact on outpatient attendances in this group. There's lots of gain, uh, lots of confounders again that could be present, including that high admission rate in the, pre in the pre and post 90 days, meaning that outpatient visits weren't required. The outpatient group did, however, have a 55% decrease in outpatient attendances. Again, potentially suggesting that this outpatient group might be more sensitive to an impact on healthcare utilisation than the home visit group. So that remains hypothetical. Now last to focus on mortality. A higher proportion of the home visiting cohort died within 90 days compared to those who were first seen in the outpatient group at 14% compared to 5%. And clearly the timing of death within that 90 days impacts the previous slides I've just shown you on outpatient attendance and hospital admissions. And more stats are planned to adjust for that. But I think it's important to consider a decrease in healthcare utilisation unadjusted for mortality. As mortality in itself is not necessarily a negative or an unwanted um, outcome in this advanced disease cohort. Many patients did choose community palliative care referral and comfort care goals following the discussion of prognosis. And this is in part how palliative care and advanced care planning reviews can decrease health care utilisation. We also assessed mortality at the time of study completion in July 2020, which, which was a variable follow up between 90 days and three years for this patient cohort. A total of 45% of the cohort died during this follow up. And the place of death was captured, showing 35% died in the palliative care unit, 16% at home or in an aged care residency, and 35% in hospital. And we can compare this to the national data, suggesting that up to 70% of COPD patients usually die in hospital. Again, this decrease is in line with one published study of integrated respiratory and palliative care in Australia, which showed hospital deaths were only 26%. Uh, so finally, in conclusion, I hope I've been able to describe to you our pilot study of a personalised, integrated model of respiratory and palliative care for patients with advanced lung disease. I've identified the differences between the outpatient and home visiting cohort, including that the home visiting cohort had lower function and a poorer prognosis and had more potential barriers to attending outpatient care. I've described the model of care, which is both evidence-based, on, based on evidence both established and emerging, is personalised and task-based, and showed that this model had a high level of future care plan discussions, including breathlessness action plans, disease action plans, and advanced care planning discussions. I also showed that the home visiting group were able to have more tasks completed per review. I've described a potential impact on healthcare utilisation with a decrease in acute hospital admissions and total bed days, as well as outpatient attendances. I showed that the home visiting group had a high number of acute hospital admissions, while the outpatient group 
seemed more sensitive to the impact of the position review on healthcare utilisation. Since the pilot completion, the respiratory palliative care home visiting service with the complex care service um, ceased due to gaps in leave cover, but then was replaced with the development of St Vincent's Hospital Melbourne's palliative care uh, com uh, community connect service. This outreach physician and nurse home visiting service is larger with uh, daily reviews available between Monday and Thursday. And although the dual trained respiratory palliative care reviews are still available to the complex care respiratory patients. The service is now much broader and able to reach unstable and deteriorating advanced disease patients from any cause at their own home and also provides in reach visits to aged care facilities within St Vincent's catchment zone. The respiratory supportive care outpatient clinic continues in that same capacity and remains open to referral. The ease of reaching patients with limited functions also increased during COVID with Medicare approving phone and telehealth consults. Other integrated models of, of palliative care also exist as St Vincent's include the heart failure supportive care, the renal supportive care and hopefully within this year a liver supportive care service. Future plans at St Vincent's also include a broader beyond the walls plan with St Vincent's developing their hospital in the home capacity to deliver high quality care to patients where they'd most rather be. The research moves towards a hopeful publication and also presentation at the upcoming Thoracic Society of Australia in New Zealand. A cost analysis of the services underway and also we've just begun analysis of 30 patient carer and GP interviews on quality of life and satisfaction with care. So with that, I'd like to thank my team for their support. Thank you all for your attention and open to questions um, while I leave a slide up of a few of the interview excerpts for you to consider. Thank you. Thanks very much, Julie. That was fantastic. And it's um, a very difficult task to condense what is uh, obviously two years of a project, but it's probably, I imagine, a year's at least worth of uh, consideration prior to the project starting, maybe even more so to condense all that information into a short period of time. So thank you very much, you've done that particularly well and congratulations on such a novel and uh, pragmatic and responsive um, approach to meeting the needs of this population group. So um, yeah, just terrific, thank you very much indeed. Uh, we have got um, several questions coming through uh, and just, just give you a chance to have a drink and catch your breath. I think the, the first one's a very easy one for me to respond to. So. A question about will the uh, presentation be available um, uh, more widely after after today? Yes, it will. So a copy of this will be uploaded to our website. I think within a matter of three or four days. And uh, uh, at least one person has just commented that it was had some issues with buffering. So our sincere apologies for, for that uh, if that occurred for, for you and for others. Um, uh, that's uh, that's not ideal. So a sincere apologies, but uh, there should be a clean version of the presentation available in a few days and you're welcome to share that with others who weren't able to be here. The next uh, question I'll hand over to you, um, Julie. So it's um, uh, from Jen who's who's asking um, how you determined uh, who would be allocated to the HV group versus the outpatient group and were they ran randomised? Um, if not, what was the basis of the decision? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So um, no, it wasn't a randomised um, trial at all, uh, just a pilot study. Um, so the who was decided to do the home visit on was, the great majority were referred from the complex care care coordinators. So the patients at the time of the pilot study were all under complex care service. Um, so they already um, had this wraparound multidisciplinary home, um, home uh, uh, service. Uh, uh, we decided on whether they could attend outpatients or home visits for, for that group, depending on their functional level and barriers to attending outpatients. So often, sometimes an outpatient uh, visit might be lined up and then um, the patient was not well or too breathless or um, et cetera. And so we changed it to a home visiting um, service. We were able to be quite responsive, I think, to the needs of the patients. So we did that. A decent number of them did flexibly move between outpatient and home visits. 
there were a lot in the outpatient group who were never under the complex care service and so were never um, never technically able to be visited at home. Uh, though that has broadened now with the Community Connect um, uh, development of the, the new service there. Also, we do a lot of outpatient clinic uh, reviews of patients from uh, Werribee and even as far as uh, Sale and Horsham, so um, we, we wouldn't be able to attend home visits that far out. Um, yeah, but in general, we, we chose to do a home visit if the patients was, were having a lot of barriers with attending clinic. Great, thanks very much, uh, Julie. And then the question from Katrina, who is um, asking um, how what proportion of the of the cohort were receiving specialist community palliative care. Um, good question. So only a very very low proportion. So the general way we set up the clinic was they started with us either at the home visit or in the outpatient service, and at, when it was felt that they um, were moving towards uh, community palliative care recruitment sort of guidelines, uh, we'd move them on. So I think I showed in one of the slides that um, around 20% of the outpatient group were referred to, oh sorry, the, of the home visiting group were referred to community palliative care and were taken on board, whereas only 9% uh, of the outpatient group. There, there was some overlap. We'd keep patients on the books until they were settled in under the community palliative care service. But in general, that was one of the points that we looked at discharging the patients to the community service. Though I must admit that that again has changed with with um, Medicare's um, development of uh, continuing phone and telehealth um, billing. So we're doing a lot more phone reviews um, to patients who are under community palliative care now. And we, and we remained available for discussion. I had a number of patients who were discharged to a community palliative care service that uh, we then re-engaged for um, specialist advice. Um, and then more recently with Community Connect, we went out and visited again due to particularly troublesome symptoms. Thank you. And um, a, a reflection uh, from Amanda who says, thank you for your presentation, my father, was a COVD patient and she says, I wish this service was around when he was still alive. So um, oh, thank you. Well done. Um, and then Jackie asks, how does St Vincent's Hospital Community Connect interact with community palliative care? Uh, is there an overlap or potential for patients to get confused about which service is providing what? Yeah, good, good question. Um, so Community Connect is considered like, a, a, again, like a connection service. So it's usually one to two visits um, to a patient who is potentially struggling at, the, at home uh, and then connect them on to a, a more long-standing service. So at present, we don't, we don't continue to manage the patient. So the great majority of the patients are then connected on to community palliative care or if that's not uh, clinically indicated, many of them we refer on to our complex care service with the Health Independence Program at St Vincent's, or um, sometimes a, a reconnection into um, the Victorian Aboriginal Health Service or uh, to St Vincent's at home if it's nursing care that they're particularly after, um, or one of the other Health Independence Programs like the Aged Care Assessment Service. So a Community Connect is considered a connection service rather than a long or medium term um, uh, connection service. But again, um, as I mentioned before, we do continue to provide uh, specialist outreach because a lot of patients who are under community palliative care, especially in the Melbourne City Mission um, catchment area are um, still regularly attend St Vincent's Hospital for acute admissions or outpatients. So sometimes um, they ask for that sort of St Vincent's specific outreach so, um, connection and we're happy to continue to see patients again once or twice if that's needed and requested from the community palliative care team. I should mention also the Community Connect service is um, is currently only nine to five Monday to Thursday as well. So it's not 24 hours like the community palliative care services are. Great, thanks Julie. And Susie um, has a question and she's asking about whether there might be a role for physiotherapy working with respiratory and palliative care consultants in the outpatient clinic or 
but can you see a role in the future potentially for that? Yes, yeah, so I, um, there's lots of things I didn't say during this presentation and one is that we do have a physiotherapist already at our respiratory clinic and our respiratory supportive care clinic is nested within that respiratory clinic. So we do have a, um, a physiotherapist at clinic um, that can be called in to see patients or booked separately to see the physiotherapist. And then in addition, um, like I mentioned, a lot of my patients were under their complex care team or um, if they weren't, we referred them. So about 31% of those who were seen in outpatients were referred to the complex care service. So then they had access to that, um, that multidisciplinary wraparound home-based care. Um, we also had a very high number of referrals to pulmonary rehab. So again, uh, physio access through pulmonary rehab. Um, and at present, um, pulmonary rehab is run um, in home and online uh, rather than the community groups due to um, due to COVID. Great, thanks, Julie. And Kirsty was um, wondering, in terms of the breathlessness um, uh, action plan that you utilised, whether or not that was a, a specific plan uh, that had been developed elsewhere, or was it something that you and your team developed specific for mm. this particular initiative? Yes, so um, no, we didn't develop it specifically. Um, it's available on the Cambridge Breathlessness Intervention Service, um, which is a website um, in Cambridge and, and a very well-established breathlessness intervention service, which is a, a short sort of um, four to eight week program um, that helps people manage their breathlessness in advanced lung disease or malignant um, or due to malignant breathlessness. Um, so it's based on that and also um, another published paper by Rocca in Canada. Um, so it's, it's, it's fairly standardised, but again, personalised to the, what the patient requires. Um, so we, we always sort of type it out and um, it can, we have the team can help translate it as well into whatever the language the patient speaks. Um, if the patient... Uh, isn't particularly literate, then um, then the complex care service are also very good at converting it into images um, to follow, including images of an inhaler and then images of a fan and um, the blowing the candle, etc. So we can do it in an image if the patient needs as well. Great, thank you. And Caroline is keen to get an understanding as to whether or not GPs were involved and if so, how, and if not, um, would you envisage in the future in the evolution of this model of care, whether they might be? So GPs were involved in that um, following every um, outpatient or home visit, um, the G GPs were a centre letter. And um, I do also have the data on how much of the time we also um, contacted the GP. It was around 60% of the visits or reviews had a GP phone call as well. And uh, in, in in addition, um, I just mentioned at the end there that um, we've just recently performed um, carer, patient and GP interviews to understand their uh, um, satisfaction with the service and also quality of life, um, the patient and carer's quality of life. Um, some some GP practices we're much more heavily involved with, um, such as the Victorian Aboriginal Health Service. Um, we've had a few sort of uh, um, team meetings with patients who have been quite complex, and also the, the co-healths, which is sort of um, close to St Vincent. So those GP practices in particular, we're much more engaged with. But I think there's always a role for expanding um, further into the community. Rocca, who I mentioned earlier, the published um, Canadian author, um, his study, um, some of his uh, reviews were based uh, in GP practices. I, sh I should also mention that one of my colleagues, um, Dr. Giorgio, is a respiratory physician and he works um, as an outreach respiratory physician with the Victorian Aboriginal Health Service as well providing um, very similar reviews there. Um, so, you know, there is that uh, connection, especially there. Great, thank you. And the next question is from Pam, who's asking about um, what percentage of the home cohort were using home oxygen. And then uh, a follow-up question, 
just about your general views on the use of oxygen in symptom management for advanced COPD and, a, and okay. some kind, kind words saying thank you very much for your great presentation. Oh, thank you. Uh, so I've got that data here, it's probably very small on the screen. So 18% of the home visiting cohort had oxygen prescribed at that initial review compared to 38% of that outpatient group. And I think there's lots of different reasons for that. Um, one is that the home visiting group did have a higher number of active current smokers. Um, but two, the home visiting group um, just had much lower healthcare engagement. So they hadn't, they often hadn't been attending the outpatient reviews or hadn't been linked to specialist outpatient respiratory. So didn't have that option of oxygen prescription. I think um, oxygen prescription is currently being re-studied, but in general, the, the two main sorts is long-term oxygen prescription, which is for a patient who is hypoxic on an arterial blood gas. Uh, and usually that means their saturations are below 92% on room air. And those patients are prescribed oxygen between 16 and 24 hours a day. And the second group that are prescribed oxygen and Oxygen are those who are breathless on exertion, who desaturate on exertion, and a six minute walk test is, a, is um, performed to see if they desaturate below 88%. So we've got very strict guidelines in Victoria about who we can prescribe oxygen to, those who desaturate on exertion, or those who qualify with an arterial blood gas um, um, for long term oxygen therapy. And we don't have much, uh, um, we don't have much ability to prescribe oxygen for patients who aren't hypoxic. And that might sound a bit harsh, but actually there's also no evidence for oxygen. So if your oxygen levels are maintained, we often talk to patients about their body being like an old car and that the engine isn't working very well, but pouring more petrol in, pouring more oxygen in doesn't necessarily help with breathlessness and doesn't help the car run faster. Um, there is, however, very good evidence that flow of air is helpful for breathlessness. And that's actually why a handheld fan is effective in breathlessness because the nose has um, breathing receptors uh, that actually fuel the fan and tells the body to slow down the breathing. And that's why a fan's effective. So, um, Sometimes patients perceive that oxygen is effective for breathlessness, um, but it may be because it's just the flow of air going past in their nose that they're feeling is helpful. So um, a long-winded answer to a question about oxygen. We should say that the only group that we are able to provide oxygen outside these guidelines for are those who are considered a very short prognosis of less than sort of six to 12 weeks. And then we can sometimes access compassionate oxygen prescription without um, without um, going through all those um, tests and investigations. Thanks, Julia. It was a very helpful response uh, and I'm sure quite informative for, for many in the audience. So thank you very much. Um, a question for someone who wanted to remain uh, anonymous is said is asking, what would your key message be for clinicians who work in regional or remote uh, areas of Victoria, Australia, who perhaps don't have so much access to specialist clinicians and the range of allied health staff that you, that you and that your team work with for context mm. um, persons uh, acknowledging that uh, their respiratory uh, specialist outpatient clinic has a wait list uh, of over two years so a very sober mm. um, kind mm. of reflection on some of the, the you know inequities in care so any thoughts about that that you might be able to convey please oh. I can, I can very much appreciate how difficult that is and also how lucky we are at St Vincent's to have such an extensive um, allied health um, service around this um, specialist supportive care um, service. So my main take home messages would probably be um, for the management of advanced lung disease, um, I'd be focusing on a breathlessness action plan that is holistic, like I mentioned, not necessarily um, moving just to the opioids for breathlessness, but ensuring that the patient is able to follow the plan of stop position, slow breathing, relax, shoulders, hand held fan before the use of opioids. Um, and the second is, is, to, um, is that we spend a lot of our time educating about action plans. So what a patient should do if they develop increased cough 
um, purulent sputum or, or shortness of breath and how to start their action plan of prednisolone and antibiotics for COPD because that's where so much of the evidence is that um, that we can drop down hospital admissions or potentially avoid hospital admissions if patients are able to feel confident with how to follow their action plan. Um, so the breathlessness action plan and the disease action plan would be my, my main two. And then the, the other strongest area of evidence is that of um, pulmonary rehab. So, well, smoking cessation and pulmonary rehab. So those two things are the biggest things we can do to help improve a patient's prognosis and their quality of life. Thanks, Julie. Um, so lots of questions. I'm not going to be able to get to all of them, um, I'm afraid. So my apologies in advance. Uh, but a question from Jen who asked, was there a psychologist involved in with the AHT? So um, the, there's two available options for psychology. Um, the first was the complex care service. So if a patient was having that home visit um, multidisciplinary wraparound, a psychologist was available um, to do outreach visits. Um, that was independent of whether they were seeing the physician home visit, um, the home, the physician um, or not. And the second was um, due to the involvement of palliative care and the respiratory support of care, we had um, access to psycho-oncology, so both uh, psych psych psychology and psychiatry were available for outpatient referral for, pa for patients with advanced lung disease, so that both those options were available. Thank you. And a, a question from Diana, who's also acknowledging that she's from New Zealand, so I'm not sure if you, Diana, if you live from New Zealand or you're in Australia, but originally from New Zealand, but either way, you're very welcome and thanks for joining sure the right. webinar. But um, uh, she asked, uh, that, Julie, do you think the Dazlam nasal spray or benzos, benzodiazepines play uh, any particular beneficial role in this cohort? Good question. Um, and uh, so I have to um, acknowledge that I was one of the authors on um, the opioids Cochrane review um, and at that time we spent a lot of time talking about the um, the use of benzos and breathlessness and there is a Cochrane review available online um, on that and overall they found that there was no evidence for or against benzos for the management of chronic breathlessness although there was a real evidence of harm so increased falls and confusion um, so um, in general I've got the stats for our group as well. I, I think in general we prescribed opioids in one percent of the cohort, um, due to the just the concern around um, it causing more harm than good in this outpatient population. However, when patients moved towards end of life care, um, and patients were referred into a community palliative care service, then opioids do play a role in the management of breathlessness at end of life. And so patients did um, usually have prescription for injectable midazolam. Sometimes oral lorazepam was added to an action plan. Um, but this was, you know, this was usually done only with extensive discussion with the patient, the GP and the carer. Um, and in the in with that home visiting support of the community palliative care service. Um, I think um, I think I should have also mentioned before the question about the GP and how we involve them. Certainly at any stage, if we considered starting opioids or benzos in a patient, um, we would be discussing that with the GP. As we had a few patients who we had to cease opioid medications because of a lack of um, full team discussion before starting and due to risks of falls or misuse. Um, medications had to be stopped more than started sometimes. Thank you. This I think will have to be our, our final um, question and again uh, sincerely our apologies because it's a number of questions I haven't been able to get to. Uh, so this question from Ian who asks should a service like this be arranged by respiratory medicine rather than specialist palliative care? So what's your viewpoint on that please Julie? Um, so that so the emerging evidence, rather than my personal um, anecdote, is that uh, um, it, patients and clinicians probably want the integrated um, 
specialist, the, the integration of specialist palliative care into the, um, the the routine care, rather than a specialist outpatient service or specialist separate service, um, because of that uh, fear of abandonment. And this is particularly evident in the renal supportive care group. I think um, patients who are under renal physicians very long standing who have always attended on a certain day at a certain time. They don't want to move to another clinic at another time. So I think um, integration of palliative care um, into the specialist clinics is step one. I think, um, you know, probably the other area that integration potentially needs to occur is the consideration of something like a multi-morbidity clinic where there, because we very much were dealing with mainly respiratory advanced lung disease and sometimes advanced heart failure. But when patients have very complex comorbidities, uh, we did continue to need specialist outpatient reviews from other teams and I would have loved or I would love a complex comorbidity clinic that had integrated palliative care as well. Thanks, Julie, for being so responsive to uh, you know, a lot of questions in, in a short period of time, and um, it's really um, very much appreciated. And thank you again for your fantastic presentation and uh, you know, the effort that went into that was obvious. And um, I'm sure people have learned a lot um, from what you conveyed and also your responses to the questions. So fantastic effort and, um, on behalf of all of us. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, if, we, if we had some flowers, we'd be giving you those in person. So hopefully maybe in the future, uh, post-COVID world, we can have you back and uh, and others to talk about this topic again, because it's obviously generated a lot of interest. Uh, and thank you very much to the Centre for Palliative Care staff um, who work extremely hard behind the scenes to ensure these webinars and these sessions go off um, particularly well. And uh, so thank you. I know um, just how much effort goes into these. So it, I mean, sincerely, it's, it's so valued and we really appreciate it. And just a bit of a, as I said, in response to the first question that was raised, a reminder that uh, this uh, webinar will be available on our website in a few days' time. So very welcome to, to look at it again or to share it with others um, who were unable to be part of today's discussion. And just a heads up for our next, next top topic, which we're planning for April, I think it is. Um, it's going to be on um, the latest in evidence around bereavement support and particularly drawing upon some of the issues that are raised by as a consequence of COVID. So that will be particularly topical and hence highly relevant for our, our hot topic uh, seminar series. So thank you again, everybody, for taking the time to be part of this. And uh, we hope you'll you'll join us again for a future offering with this, within this seminar series. I'll, I wish you a, a lovely evening and we'll see you again in the future. And thanks again for being part of it. All the best. Thank you.